morning and welcome this morning to St. Paul's United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. We are a welcoming church that lives by faith, that is known by love, and is a voice of hope to the world. Today it looks like the world is leaning kind of on this way towards the left, so you guys need to sit hard, okay? <laughs> Um, take a moment to sign the friendship register and you can leave those in your pews. A reminder that at the back we have newly designed 275th anniversary t-shirts um, and that celebration is going to be on September the 10th. Everybody who wants to buy one is welcome to and um, we'll have them here. If you want to wear them on the 10th, uh, that'll be great. You don't have to dress up for that. Day, although I might, well, I think I'll probably wear a t-shirt too, just to support the cause. Um, also, um, just before that, two weeks earlier than that, we're having the dedication of the Cyber House. It is um, much, much closer to being ready to be occupied. We're hoping, shooting for September 1st. And so on the 25th of, or 27th of August, we're going to have that dedication and ribbon cutting right after worship and as well as a tour of the house so please come um, it'll be it's amazing what a difference how it looks now compared to uh, a, a year ago at this time and we're delighted that we're going to be able to have a family in there before too long that needs temporary housing so thank you all for your prayers and your hard work um, and are there any announcements to be made from the congregation this morning? And if not, I would ask that you would check the worship bulletin or other announcements. Um, I was telling Becky that we have so many reminders that I'm going to forget them all because there's so many of them. But pay attention to the reminders about things that are coming up in the next couple weeks. And with that in mind, I would ask that you would stand as you are able for our call to worship. Let us say this together. We gather, we gather here in anticipation, seeking an encounter with our holy God, who comes among us when we least expect it, who invites us to wrestle with our questions and doubts, who richly blesses us and calls each of us by name. Let us worship God together. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, which is number 350, The Summons. Thank you.
Jacob and Esau, Leah and Rachel, and we see in their stories reflections of the struggles in our world today, including some of our own struggles. And so let our struggles call us to reflection and confession as we pray together the prayer of confession that's in our bowls. And let us pray together. Merciful, Merciful God, God, the story of Jacob shows your willingness to enter into the messiness of our human struggles, into fractured relationships, family differences, unreconciled situations with people we care about. Yet we confess that too often we hold on because we do not want to lose in our grave our possessions and our selfish desires. Often we fear that our very own lives will be dislocated by your kingdom values of justice, mercy, and peace. Help us wrestle with the conflicting values, desires, and pressures that confront us daily so that we can unclench our hands and open ourselves to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Only then can we fully embrace others in their name and be embraced in the name of Christ. Amen. Feel God's healing love pouring over you and into your life this morning. Know that God delights in you and will always be present with you. This indeed is the good news of the gospel. And in Jesus' name, we are forgiven. Thank you.
scripture today is from the 32nd chapter of Genesis, beginning with the 27th verse. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's, Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Susan. This morning in Cola class, we, we wrestled with this text. It's quite an interesting and amazing text. And um, one of the things that we mentioned was that, like, we imagined that Jacob was a young guy, maybe 20 or 25 in this text. But he's actually a very, very old man, um, which adds a whole different flavor to this. He's been on the run for 20 years. Um, he's probably at least middle age, if not significantly older than that. So this telling of this, this liminal, pivotal, pivotal time in Jacob's life is reminiscent of the night he'd spent 20 years earlier as he fled from his brother Esau, who threatened his very life for stealing the blessing that was rightly Esau's. Alone and on the run, he dreamt of a ladder stretching between heaven and earth and angels going up and down the ladder. He named the place Bethel, the house of God. And just like at Bethel, Jacob is alone again at night. He had sent messengers to his brother, whom he calls at this point in time, my Lord Esau, that he was on his way. And the messengers reported back that Esau was coming to meet him with 400 men. Jacob was incredibly distressed and afraid. He sent ahead a gift of over 750 heads of goats, camels, steer, and donkeys in hopes of appeasing Esau. And then he divided all of the people, his wives, his concubines, all of his animals, his slaves, and sent them to the other side of the Jabbok River. And he divided them in half, hoping that if Esau attacked one half, at least the others might survive that attack. And now, for the first time in Genesis 29, 19, or verse 9 to, to um, I'm sorry, Genesis 32, verses 9 to 12, this is the first time in Scripture that we hear Jacob praying. I think if I had my brother who might be estranged from me, who might be coming to attack me and my family, prayer would be one of the things I would do as well. He prays this, listen to his prayer. I am not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and faithfulness that you have shown me. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us, all of us, the mothers and the children. Yet you, God, have promised to do good to me, to make my offspring more than can be counted. By the way, this is the longest prayer in the book of Genesis. On the lips 
of Jacob, the cheater and deceiver. Once again, he is alone as the sun set, and sleep seems to be deserting him. Anne Lamott once wrote, Every single time I let go of something, I leave claw marks on it. That sounds, that sounds a lot like those of us who've been talking about cleaning out our homes and giving things away. Um, and that sounds a lot like Jacob. A man, angel of God, wrestled with him all night long. And Jacob held on, outweighed, outmatched, yet refusing to let go until he is blessed which ironically in this case came not by trickery or lying, but in the down and dirty, muddy, sweaty, never give up wrestling match. Near daybreak, the man asked Jacob, what do you want? And Jacob, coming to a place of brutal honesty, revealed what his deepest desire had always been and still was. I will not let you go until you bless me. The man slash angel slash God asked Jacob's name, and Jacob, the cheater, liar, deceiver, speaks the truth in uttering his very name, the name that defined his whole life. Jacob, the heel, the grabber, the deceiver. And in that moment of honesty, he is given a new name. Your name will no longer be Jacob. From now on, it is Israel, which means wrestles with God. You've wrestled with God and humans and have prevailed. The encounter left a limp, a mark on his side that he carried from that place for the rest of his life. Life sometimes is like that. Things happen. Life happens, and none of us, none of us, escape without some scars and limps. It is just the way life is for us, although often our scars and our limps are invisible. We might look great on the outside, like y'all do this Sunday morning, but I suspect that our hearts and our minds and our souls might be limping along a bit today and sometimes wishing that it was all over. We survive with nothing else than by an elegant, it, it's nothing elegant, but simply it is the truth that we don't give up. And I suspect that it is in our not giving up that our greatest blessings lie. Beth Tanner, an Old Testament professor, wrote this. In life, often all we can do is hang on. We cannot defeat grief or heartbreak. They will leave a mark. We must be like Jacob and refuse to let go of God until a blessing provides new insights that will once again transform us. Just as God fights for us, Sometimes we must fight our questions and our doubts and our pain and refuse to let go until we are blessed enough to continue on this journey with God. Today, if we dare, we can lift up and even celebrate our struggle for a relationship with God and the mysteries of life, not as a platitude or just nice words, but by remembering that God does not give up on us. And it is our job not to give up on God. The Christian life is oftentimes difficult. Jacob was far from perfect, but he was faithful. In this text, he becomes, of all things, a role model, not of moral perfection, but of one who wrestled in the night with God and did not surrender. And his new name, Israel, is a lesson worth learning. From, for it is from Israel 
those who wrestle with God and come through, that our own Judeo-Christian roots spring. Do you ever wrestle with God? I, I know that I do. For instance, we've emerged from a pandemic to find that the same political and social and cultural issues that were revealed during the pandemic are here now on steroids, so it seems. We have not found a vaccination for what ails our nation or our world. Our home, planet Earth, is on fire. It's the hottest it has been in over 120,000 years, according to some scientists' thinking. I worry, I worry about the world that my children, my grandchildren, and hopefully someday their children will inherit from us. And I sound like my mother because I remember when I was coming up, her worrying about the world because she was fearful that we would all be killed by a nuclear bomb. I, I think that perhaps we may become at some point the irreparable divided states of America instead of the United States of America. I fear that maybe someday we will live on a planet that is devoid of peaches and, and of safe beaches and oceans to swim in. Man, I want my grandchildren to enjoy peaches and beaches as much as I do. And I have to say that this is not all at all what I imagined or planned for when I was growing up. This is not the blessing that I had in mind. I don't think that the questions or the wrestling is what I get wrong. I think what I get wrong is the belief that a blessing is something that I have a right to or a reward I can earn. Barbara Brown Taylor reflects that Jacob, like us, presents God with our conditions for our belief in God, and we persist in telling God what it means to be with us, to keep us safe, to feed and clothe us, to let us pursue our lives in peace, while the God of the covenant provides a very different answer to that prayer, one that involves struggle and questions that aren't always answered, and yet always a blessing that promises God's presence with us every single step of the way. Jacob asked the wrestler for his name, a name that wouldn't be given to the Israelites until generations when Moses, a descendant of Jacob, encountered God, the God, he encountered the God of Bethel at a place in a desert under a burning bush, and he heard God utter these words, I am. But like that first encounter with God at Bethel, Jake names this place Peniel, face of God. For I have seen the face of God, and yet my life has been spared. The blessing, the blessing it seems to me, is coming through it limp and all, and realizing that God is there with you, with me, every step of the way, face to face. C.S. Lewis wrote these wise words. There is but one good, that is God. Everything else is good when it looks to him and bad when it turns from him. This is what mortals misunderstand. Mortals say of temporal stuff of sufferings, no future bliss can make up for it, not knowing that heaven once attained, will work backward and turn even that agony into glory. There is but one good. 
despite what all the advertisements and politicians and cable news networks will tell us. And that good is God. God is the exquisitely simple and at the same time difficult answer to all that woes us. God, who we understand in the flesh as Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, demonstrated for us how to live, how we are to live with God, loving God with all of our heart and mind and body and soul, not just for an hour on Sunday or when we feel like it, but all of us, all of the time, and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, and understanding that love of neighbor is what justice is all about. You know, it is often easier, at least in the short term, to ignore the people and the situations that make us uncomfortable. But that is kicking the proverbial can down the road. A week ago yesterday, I facilitated a boundary awareness training for pastors, part one. Doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> Four hours of boundary training. It's something that pastors do repeatedly. It's a requirement, and every so many years, we have to go through boundary training again. It's all about good self-care in order for us to be able to care appropriately for others. And I have to tell you that it got me wrestling with what I know is healthy self-care versus what I sometimes, not, let me say, I often, always practice. Richard Rohr says this, that which isn't transformed is transmitted. And it hit me in a new way that I am not a model of good self-care. I might be a good model of pastoral care, but not self-care. We had a quiz that we asked everyone in the group who was there, and there were 14 pastors plus three of us facilitating it. And when the, the question came up, do you, uh, do you have a Sabbath every week? There was like one or two hands that actually brave enough to raise their hand. Do you not ever take phone calls during dinner? Everybody's hands were down. Um, you know, do you ever turn your phone off? All of our hands were down. And it hit me in a, in a, in a new way that I'm not a good model of self-care. I work far beyond all that's expected. Um, in all of my life, I have had the great 